What's up everyone? Welcome back to another late night, another picture we're going to get into. This once again is epic by all proportions. It's a classic from 1960, one of Alfred Hitchcock's most famous film. It's been remade. Um, it's not as good as the original. And the reason why I'm going to it, Psycho, 1960s Psycho, although I've seen it before, is because I've never seen the sequels. I know there there is a sequel and there is the TV show that sort of gets into the background of it all, Bates Motel, but sort of like Jaws, kind of interested to go back to the original picture, which I've seen before, watch it, see if I get anything new, because it's just one of those films where every watch, you learn something new, you pick up something, and eventually get to the sequels. And yeah, I'm just excited, excited to see anything new, excited to hear your guys' um, comments, and some of the educational tidbits that you might share that I might not have known about. Yeah, this is a great film. I really like the designers as well. Saul Bass, the introductory title sequence. So this is going to be quite a blast. Glad to be back. Uh, but yes, without any further delay, let's get right into the picture. Because Captain, we are a go. <laughs> From the very start, just with the music, just with the simple lines, it kind of adds a suspense to it, the sort of off-kilter, everything is broken and it sort of adds to it, sort of the psychological thriller aspect. But to me, they also look like blinds. I've never thought about that, but I mean, that's the closest thing I, I could think of. And I know this picture has that voyeuristic sort of peeping Tom angle to it all. Yeah, Alfred Hitchcock, Bernard Herman, and Saul Bass, when you combine all these three and some probably some other ca um, team members, crew members, you get a recipe for a masterpiece. I don't remember the film opening that specifically, like Phoenix, Arizona, 2.43, the time, and even the date. And I like that we even started out with the blinds. Tired of sweating for people who aren't there. I sweat to pay off my father's debts and he's in his grave. I sweat to pay my ex-wife alimony and she's living on the other side of the world somewhere. I pay too. They also pay who meet in hotel rooms. It's strange, the film starts out with this sort of forbidden love that's secretive and the theme goes on and this is sort of a private space that we're not privy to but again, it sets the, the standard for all the themes that follow. There we go, Alfred Hitchcock making uh, his own infamous cameo which i think sort of directors also take upon like quentin tarantino uh, tomorrow's the day my sweet little girl oh oh not not you my daughter a baby and tomorrow she stands her sweet self up there and gets married away from me that's funny everybody's talking about marriage having family the husband calling the mother calling She's sort of the oddball. <laughs> I never carry more than I can afford to lose. <laughs> Count them. I declare. I don't. That's how I get to keep it. Tom. Oh, <laughs> Immoral. He was flirting with you. I guess he must have noticed my wedding ring. Oh boy, all that cash in her purse on a hot day, on a Friday? Mm -hmm. 
it's funny, the lies goes around and nobody really starts out the film as somebody to root for. It's funny that we have the picture, I think, of the mother and the father behind. <laughs> sort of seeing what she's doing. Or witnessing. Not necessarily that she made up her mind to take the money. <laughs> oh boy, that's when she has to drive. <laughs> I, I'll, I really like when Quentin Tarantino recreated that in Pulp Fiction. It almost feels like we've entered into the paintings that were behind her desk at her workplace. Because it sort of had those wide landscapes with the roads. There are plenty of motels in this area. You should have, I mean, just to be safe. I didn't intend to sleep all night. I just pulled over. Have I broken any laws? No, ma'am. Then I'm free to go. She doesn't even blink. <laughs> that That's... Uh... <laughs> Like her alertness, and from what we know, what she has done. And just like that, the plot gets thicker, the lies are, <laughs> the lies just feel, it feels so tangible. That instant sigh of relief. But correct me if I'm wrong. Is she not look like when she is? Is she not looking directly at us? Like sort of almost breaking the fourth wall. Well, another thing, those opening title sequences with the bars, it feels very claustrophobic and sort of trying to try to imagine her anxiety must feel claustrophobic with everything just tightening in. I take it you can prove that car is yours. I mean, uh, out of state license and all, uh, you got your pink slip. And I your... believe I have the necessary papers. Is there a ladies room? In the building. <laughs> Salesman is is suspicious. What's going on? Why in such a hurry? No negotiating. Oh boy, <laughs> just like a shark waiting, waiting, tailing her. She looked like a wrong one to you. Acted like one. The only funny thing, she paid me seven hundred dollars in cash. She has enough, enough information to simulate a conversation in her head to sort of add to the paranoia. Wait a minute. I did see her sometime later driving. Uh, I think you'd better come over here to my office, quick. Carolyn, get Mr. Cassidy for me. Well then again, is this in her head or is this actually what is really going on? And... I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming more the former. It must be some kind of a mystery. I, I can't. You check with the bank, no? They never laid eyes on her, no? You still trusting? Hot creeper. She sat there while I dumped it out. Hardly even looked at it. Planning and and even flirting with me. Now that that sort of smile and smirk seems sort of psychotic. <laughs> The infamous Bates Motel. I wonder whether that sign has ever been sold as like a memorabilia piece. Twelve cabins, twelve vacancies. They, uh, they moved away the highway. Oh, I thought I'd gotten off the main road. Twelve vacancies, that's just creepy. <laughs> Talk about cheap motels, they were talking about cheap mo uh, motels in the beginning of the film, and now she's in one. And the, uh... Over there. The bathroom. Yeah. 
Well, uh, if, if, if you want anything, just just tap on the wall. It's kind of funny the way he's dressed and his demeanor. Almost seems like his coat is way too big for him. Sort of swallowing up his image. Hiding in plain sight. Go on, go tell her she'll not be appeasing her ugly appetite with my food or my son. Or do I have to tell her because you don't have the guts? Huh, boy? You have the guts, boy? Shut up! Shut up! I do suppose Bates Motel, the TV show, sort of gets into the mother-son dynamics of, you know, how he got this personality disorder or the split personality where he's sort of um, demeaning himself like very accurate uh, not accurately but very harshly and I mean the, his voice was so loud she could hear it from all the way down in the motel and just the the picture of the silhouette of the house and one light shining very effective in terms of like setting up this haunted like house or mansion i wish you could apologize for other people don't worry about it but as long as you fix the supper we may as well eat it he, he sort of won her her sort of appreciate like so, sort of gain some type of sympathy you're very kind it's all for you I'm not hungry. Go ahead. If anything's uncomfortable, it's you eating and somebody watching you eat. Do you go out with friends? Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. You've never had an empty moment in your entire life, have you? Only my share. Where are you going? I didn't mean to pry. I'm looking for a private island. <laughs> it's funny to see this dynamic between... Well, the first the first film and the beginning of the film, we see her, you know, sort of in love with this very masculine, sort of stereotypical type of man uh, who has, you know, sort of responsibilities and, and sort of taken responsibilities. And uh, sort of the submissive state to it. And we see him in the complete opposite role. You understand? I don't hate her. I hate what she's become. I hate the illness. Wouldn't it be better if you put her someplace? You mean an institution? A madhouse? Just the angles that it's cut, that they're covering off his facial reactions, the taxidermy, sort of the taxidermy as a, sort of this explanation for him dressing up as his mom. And it's funny that there's always eyeballs everywhere. It seems she's hurting you. I meant well. People always mean well. They cluck their thick tongues and shake their heads and suggest oh so very delicately. He doesn't even blink as well. Funny. He he wishes he could curse, the, and, but he has also a defensive side to his mom. Oh, you, you're not uh, you're not going back to your room already. I'm very tired, and I'll have a long drive tomorrow. All the way back to Phoenix. Really? I stepped into a private trap back there, and I'd like to go back and try to pull myself out of it. Well, there we go. Is she honest? Is she lying? I'll bring you some breakfast, all right? What time? Very early. Dawn. All right, Miss... Uh... Crane. Crane, that's it. Good night. Let's just assume Crane was because she was surrounded by all the taxidermy. It's 
seems even his development, like his stance, it sort of seems childlike. Even what he has for dinner, like sandwiches and milk, is still very childlike. That's the that's probably the only uh, like thing that comes to mind is he has probably his development has stunted. A good shower always seems to wash away all problems. Again, we're witnessing an extremely brutal murder in a very intimate space. Probably this and Zodiac. If you've seen a Zodiac, there is one stabbing sequence where just with the sound and you know with the just the motion you don't really zodiac is a lot more explicit but both films really portray the brutality of um sort of how well the sequence was number one uh shot but alfred hitchcock also having to deal with you know sort of the restrictions and you know an audience that probably has never seen this level of violence, which makes it so interesting. And his, his fright seems extremely genuine, almost to the point where he did not know what he did which makes this, this his case all the more interesting. And that, that just that frame of her eye looking directly, you know, as she's laying on the floor, beautiful frame, transitioning from the drainage to her eye. seems <laughs> as if you know the the work he was describing that he does with the motel and the gr the groundskeeping and you know taking care of each room this almost seems like the majority of the work <laughs> he takes everything but the newspaper and only we know at this point <laughs> that the money is hidden inside And just like that, <laughs> the lie is completely erased. When it never should have been a lie, but everything, the 40,000, well, 39,300, completely gone. It's funny, it's like it's sinking into a black lagoon. Well, across his Sam's letterhead, it said Fairvale. So she was actually really close to him. Now, what thing could we be in together? Sorry about the tears. Well, is Marion in trouble? What is it? Let's all talk about Marion, shall we? Everybody just stares at the camera. <laughs> it's so wonderful. Um, and he was, if I'm not mistaken, he was in, uh, the previous picture that we just saw with, uh, Marlon Brando, uh, on the waterfront. He was also a detective, if I'm not mistaken. Sam, they don't want to prosecute. They just want the money back. Sam, if she's here... She isn't. She isn't. Miss Crank, can I ask you a question? Did you come up here on just a hunch and nothing more? Not even a hunch, just hope. Oh, that is her real name. That is her real last name. So, Crane just, uh, she probably just... For for went her sort of guys. He doesn't have a really good diet. He's eating candy. I don't know what he's eating straight out of his pocket, but terrible. Uh, again, a child's diet. Well, want to come in and register? No, no, no. Sit down. I don't want to trouble you. I just want to ask you a few questions. No, that's and... no trouble. Uh, today's linen day. I always change the beds here once a week, whether they've been used or not. Hate the smell of dampness, don't you? It's such mm. a 
I don't know, creepy smell. Come on. Mm -hmm. There's all this thing about temperatures. Arizona's hot. When she came here, it was raining. Then there's the dampness. There's this whole temperature theme that's going on. We have reason to believe that she came along this way, may have stopped in the area. Did she stop here? Well, no one stopped here for a couple of weeks. Do you mind looking at the picture before committing yourself? Commit myself? You sure talk like a policeman. <laughs> Look at the picture, please. <laughs> well, to that, to that man's uh, sort of privatized money, he can't hire a police to get back the 40000 Get the date somewhere. There's nobody. As soon as the lie starts to run out of its legs, <laughs> his demeanor is completely changed. Here we are. Marie Samuels. That's an interesting address. Is That's that her? Yeah. yeah, I think so. Marie. Marion. Samuels. Her boyfriend's name is Sam. Mm -hmm. That was such an interesting angle. It almost seemed like he was an animal. Like, such a pronounced jawline. Just, we see the undercarriage. Make any phone calls? or No. Locally? Did you spend the night with him? No. Well, then, how would you know that she didn't make any phone calls? <laughs> it's almost like a parent is is questioning a boy. It's his demeanor and the way he says no. Uh, how did she pay you? Cash, check? Cash. Cash, huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, after she left, she uh, didn't come back? Hmm. Well, why should she? <laughs> It seems like when the camera switches from like his bottom view to the top view, he almost switches like demeanor. He stops blinking. He becomes more confident in his answers. I think I must have one of those faces you just can't help believing. Is anyone at home? No. Oh, well, there's somebody sitting up in the window. No, 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 there isn't. Oh, sure, go ahead, take a look. Oh, that, that, uh, that must be my mother. She's, she's an, an invalid, an invalid. Uh, it's, uh, it's practically like living alone. Oh, I see. Like taxidermy, he's just just standing remotely there. <laughs> he's smiling. <laughs> I I never picked up on that smile. I don't know. That seems very fresh. And again, it almost seems like he's he's happy with it. He's happy by the pursuit or the the sus suspicion. You'll be happy to know what I think. Uh, I think our friend, uh, Sam Loomis, didn't know that Marion was here. Yeah. All right, see you in about an hour, or less. Arbogast is just a... He's a... It's a great name. He's a cool guy. I really like him. He really fits the role really well. But even just his description of um, Patrick, you know, he calls him a boy mother is uh, still the, the, the his the relationship he sort of paints of himself is one of complete dependency even though the mother is invalid you know sort of he still resorts to her judgment It's like that, you know, those paintings where no matter how you, how far you differ from the painting, the eye is always looking at you. Now this perhaps is one of my favorite sequences, Hitchcock and staircases, you know, when you sort of go places you're not supposed to, uh, the staircase just seems like, he, Hitchcock made the staircase scary, to go up into the unknown where you're not supposed to be and you get punished for it. Very interesting camera effect. It made him look so tiny in this gigantic house. Sometimes Saturday night has a lonely sound. Ever notice that, Lila? 
Sam, he said an hour or less. Saturday, Friday, Sunday. It, it, just by the announcing of it at the very beginning, it almost makes it procedural. Arbogast! Hitchcock just did such a good job of, like, utilizing every aspect of this actor's facial feature, making him seem like this robotic shark. That's all I can think of a shark, Jaws. How'd you and this detective come to trace her to Fairvale? I thought you'd be coming to me. Left Phoenix under her own steam? Yes. She's not missing so much as she's run away. That's right. From what? She stole some money. <laughs> oh, now that makes the 40 grand null and void if they ever found it. He wasn't out when you were there. He just wasn't answering the door in the dead of night like some people do. This fellow lives like a hermit. You must remember that bad business out there about 10 years ago. Please, call. Well... Since he is the local, you know, authority, they know everything. And, and sort of even the wife gave him that look as in, oh, you're talking about the mother? Mother has passed away. Mrs. Bates poisoned this guy she was involved with when she found out he was married. Then took a help into the same self herself. Strychnine. Ugly way to die. Norman found them dead together. In bed. Well, again, this is... the We don't even know if that narrative is true to begin with. You want to tell me you saw Norman Bates' mother? But it had to be. Because Arbogast said so, too. And the young man wouldn't let him see her because she was too ill. Well, if the woman up there is Mrs. Bates, who's that woman buried out in Green Lawn Cemetery? The plot. Thickens. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I told you to get out, boy. I'll carry you, Mother. Norman, what do you think you're doing? Don't you touch me. Don't. Norman! Put me down. Put me down. I can walk. A brilliant my... angle. Brilliant angle to go to, you know, sort of. As a, as a new audience watching this for the first time, you would even think to yourself, did Mrs. Bates pass away with the poison? Did she die? Until at the very end, there's that explosion of a scene. We're going to register as man and wife. We're going to get shown to a cabin. And then we're going to search every inch of the place, inside and out. They're going to... Register as man. Literally everybody lies in this film. Uh, well, some people for the r right reasons and some people for really wrong reasons. Suppose you want a room. We were going to try to make it straight to San Francisco, but uh, we don't like the look of that sky. Looks like a bad day coming, doesn't it? Okay. I don't know why, but the Norman Bates' shoulders seem abnormally square, almost like a Frankenstein. Now I'll show you the cabin. Don't bother yourself. We'll find it. Well, Sam even just talking to Norman is like this big, big, uh, like, <laughs> big towering figure of a, of a macho man talking to a boy again. It almost seems like he could bully him to a conversation. Arbogast. He liked me, Sam. Or he felt sorry for me, and he was beginning to feel the same way about you. I could tell the last time I talked to him on the phone. He wouldn't have gone anywhere or done anything without telling us unless he was stopped. And he was stopped. So he must have found out something. It's funny, the only person who doesn't know about the 40,000 is Norman Bates.
Norman could easily just be looking at what they're doing by that small little peephole. You're looking for me? Yes, <laughs> oh boy, he's just waiting there. And most definitely, he was looking through the hole. This is completely out of left field, but just looking at the house on top of this hill almost reminds me of you know close encounters of a third kind when you see the devil's tower on top like as a standalone in, in front of this like huge landscape so almost seems like it but it's definitely not <sighs> She has laid her, his mom down there so long it made an indentation on the bed. And that mirror thing is is pretty pretty interesting as well, all to the, you know, the split personality of him dressing up as his mom. I bet your mother knows where the money is and what you did to get it. I think she'll tell us. Where's that girl you came here with? Where is she? A, ner a nervous and, uh, you know, frightened Norman Bates. <laughs> it, he's a completely different character. Mrs. Bates. Oh, boy. <laughs> that, that must have shocked everyone. He almost treated his mom like tax well taxider. It almost it, the, the wig, everything. He almost well, I I would guess the wig is actually his mom's hair. Sort of interesting now to think about Bates Motel going more in into the mom's influence. I assume that's what the show is about. Well, now look, if you're trying to lay some psychiatric groundwork for some sort of plea, this fellow would like to cop this. <laughs> a psychiatrist doesn't lay the groundwork. He merely tries to explain it but my sister is yes yes i'm sorry the private investigator too and the forty thousand and for years the two of them lived as if there was no one else in the world then she met a man and it seemed to norman that she threw him over for this man now that pushed him over the line and he killed them both well, then again, how can we trust this narrative if it's the truth? There's no way to fully believe it. Now, after the murder, Norman returned as if from a deep sleep. And like a dutiful son, covered up all traces of the crime he was convinced his mother had committed. Well, again, that's, that's assuming that his mother was as jealous of him as much as he was jealous of her. You see... When the mind houses two personalities, there's always a conflict, a battle. In Norman's case, the battle is over, and the dominant personality has won. And the $40,000? Who got that? <laughs> Erased. I mean, talk about an un unsatisfactory ending. They're probably watching me. Well, let them. Let them see what kind of a person I am. I'm not even gonna swat that fly. I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know. And they'll say, why, she wouldn't even harm a fly. Oh, boy, that, that, uh... What do you call that? That double, ex not exposure, but that exposed scene and you almost see the skull and then the car comes out and it's the end and it's fragmented. It's the perfect ending.
thoughts, thoughts on this masterful film. What an ending. What a picture. Again, we can only imagine what it was probably like to have seen this in 1960. How this probably would have smashed, um, broken every record possible. I'm, I'm not so sure of it. I'm just assuming that, you know, as an audience member, you would probably want to go again to the cinema to rewrite this thriller of a film. Um, where you're almost at the edge of your seat the entire film. Not only does the music and the soundtrack get you there, but the editing, the pacing, the fact that we almost have two films in one, the, the beginning portion is a runaway film, the end is this detective film. Uh, again, uh, when I was looking, when I was watching the film, the beginning portion goes by so quickly. We almost finished that hour. That hour feels like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. It's so well paced, so well directed, so well edited. The it's because again, you're you're I felt so engrossed in the film to the point where I was rooting for her to escape. But then I knew by rooting for her to escape, I'm sort of uh, an accomplice in her stealing this 40,000. The 40,000 is the MacGuffin. And then it's soon, sooner or later, by the second half of the, uh, the, the film, it sort of disappears. That becomes obsolete. And the story, there's almost another story in itself coming out where the mother and Norman Bates, Norman Bates, again, I had an interesting character. We want to know more about him. We want to know more about the mother. And that's sort of what spins off as to talk about a film that would demand a second film. It would be this. But sort of ending on that, you know, unsatisfactory ending. Whereas, you know, you talk about the films of the, um, I don't know, 50s, 60s. Uh, well, specifically 50s and 40s, you know, films, I would assume, again, that they sort of had to end on a happy ending to sort of set out um, this um, this Hollywood standard. But Alfred Hitchcock being the, was the contrarian that he is, this visionary director, um, not, not afraid to be bold and push the envelope. And again, one of the few films where I, I just noticed it that the exposition came at the very end. There was literally no exposition throughout the entire film. Nothing was explained. Characters went, you know, not knowing information. There was certain information that we were privy to, certain information that at, at a later stage we were privy to. Another thing, yes. The killing of a main character. Again, this was pro must have been brought up um, many times, but she's uh, like she wasn't the main character. Miss uh, Miss Crane, she wasn't the main character, and to kill off a main character, what a bold decision. Um, and, well, and then you, and then you sort of go into Alfred Hitchcock's whole thing about like killing blondes and and so on well, like his over brutality and you know though that first shower sequence could have probably been you know shot um with less uh, less shots off you know sort of the brutality uh, it, it could have been filmed a lot quicker but it was a it was really extended um but it sort of goes to his effectiveness and sort of the um, twistedness of the film and just as a as a, as an audience member being tortured along watching the sequence uh, in a very private uh, private space um, but it was really fun watching this again um, I, I sort of sort of exhausted some of my thoughts I'm pretty sure as as soon as I turned uh, the camera off well just the, the, the film will continue to linger on um, more, more as a meditative piece than to overanalyze it. You know, it's a great film just as is, but it's a great film also just to think about and to admire and to, to keep going back 
to it as the layers keep you know you, you could enjoy this film on multiple layers it's really enjoyable um really masterfully directed and it stands the test of time it feels like it could play to a modern audience um it it's really ageless uh, there's almost nothing aging it besides the cars and and whatever have you but really perfect a perfect film really really perfect film and yeah a great start to the 1960s um it's hard to top this you know as a thriller um but yeah glad to have watched it with everyone hope i do not talk too much to the point where people got annoyed but i have seen the film before um but yeah do share your thoughts do share your comments was there anything i was off about was there anything that i missed if there's anything you could educate me on please do write it in the comments i do read them um but yeah until the next picture stay calm stay um stay right uh do the right thing um uh, another great film by spike lee uh but do the right thing and don't run away if you're in arizona you know get a drink don't let the headache get to you um but yeah until i see you in the next picture have a good one take care guys what's up you cinephiles thank you very much for making it to the very end me and big willy don't take that for granted we really appreciate you now if you'd like to show your support to us you know what you can do up here you can smash that button really just smash it and you know if you would like to check out some more content they're all curated by days up over here and playlists so you know what we hope you're having a great day don't crumble and just continue to smile and be a good bastion of cinema.